every financial crisis you care to think of in the last 20 years has been a debt refinancing crisis. And that's what central banks are in the game to try and stop. And what we're seeing now, I would argue, is the reason that liquidity is going up is very simply that the financial system in the West is in a more fragile situation than many people are attesting to. And therefore, it needs liquidity. And the central banks are providing liquidity. The Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially. Thank you so much for joining us here on this channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Soar Financial Group. And of course, your host for this conversation today. And we've invited a guest back that we've had on a number of times. We've had excellent feedback on his analysis. And uh, personally, I really enjoy talking to him, listening to him as well, because I learned so much from him. It's Michael Howell. He's the managing director over at Cross Border Capital. And he's, he's the king of liquidity. Every Everybody accepts his uh, his analysis on liquidity. I think nobody else does it like him. And it's it's really important to look at liquidity flows at the current time. Like what what is happening in the world? Where is the money flowing from, or where to and where from? Of course, because if you look at the U.S. debt situation, it needs to get covered. Liquidity needs to flow into the U.S. And we're going to discuss where it is coming from. Of course, we're also going to talk about other asset classes, commodities we need to talk about. Why are they breaking out? Gold trading at all-time highs, copper is rallying, ACK commodities are rallying as well. I'm not sure we're going to get into the ACK commodities, but uh, chocolate or cocoa is rallying like crazy. Uh, I was shocked by the sticker price yesterday at a chocolate store here in Vancouver. Absolutely insane. Um, so lo lots to talk about. And uh, before I switch over to my guest, quick reminder, hit that subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously, bringing guests like Michael on more regularly and, uh, of course, bring other fantastic guests on this channel as well. So without much further ado, Michael, it's great to have you back on the program. It's good to see you again. Great pleasure to be here, Kai. Absolutely. Michael, like we, I mentioned to you before hitting the record button, there, there's a lot to talk about. And I'm not even sure where to start. I've mentioned that to you as well, because there is so much. But uh, maybe we start with a bit of a summary and recap. Like, how is the global liquidity situation right now? How, how is it looking? Because if I look at the all-time highs of S&P, Bitcoin, gold, there's enough liquidity around. Sure. I mean, markets are telling a story. Um, and our line is always that money moves markets. And so if you've got rising markets, rising asset markets worldwide, it's pretty much confirming the fact that liquidity, the liquidity cycle is, is rising. It's buoyant. There's a lot of liquidity in markets right now, uh, despite what the Federal Reserve protests or keeps saying that they're tightening. I mean, the reality is they're not tightening enough. Uh, and uh, the fact is that Jay Powell has already indicated that the next move in US interest rates is downward. So we're going to get more liquidity, not less, uh, probably over coming months. Now, one of the things that we do is we take a long term view of liquidity. We try and put it into a cyclical context. Uh, that's the best way to understand it. Liquidity goes up and comes down. But there's a fairly regular cycle. Uh, in actual fact, there's a chart that you can uh, take a look at that, uh, that we put up, which is looking at the long term liquidity cycle that basically goes back uh, all the way to 1970. In fact, we can stretch it beyond that, in fact, if, uh, if need be. But uh, the pattern you can see uh, pretty much remains the same. You see this alternating five to six year cycle in markets. Uh, we hit a low point around the end of 2022 that coincided with the British guilt crisis when uh, uh, the new incoming prime minister announced a budget the market didn't take very well. Uh, British guilt market or the British guilt market, the treasury market in the UK sold off very aggressively. And there was an attempt to try and stabilize that by putting more liquidity in. But it was a wake up call for treasury ministers and central bankers worldwide, that liquidity was basically too tight and it was hitting the floor. Very soon after that, within about two or three months, there was the SVB crisis in the US. That was another alarm bell. And really from that point, you can see from the chart that liquidity conditions, the black line there, have basically moved upwards. And we think that cycle is heading to a peak sometime around late 2025. Now, uh, the dotted red line is a sine wave we put on top of there. Uh, on top of the actual cycle, uh, that sine wave was uh, was constructed uh, back in year 2000. So it's been projected uh, at a constant five to six year frequency thereafter. So it hasn't. It's not a fudge. We haven't fitted it to the data. Uh, it's actually, in fact, been uh, uh, what you see is pretty much what you get here. The cycles line up quite nicely with this five to six year rhythm. And we think that uh, the trough was 22. The peak will be late 2025. And markets are going to see the benefits of rising liquidity uh, over coming months. 
it won't be a straight line, but um, as you can see, it rarely is. But the trend is definitely upwards. Uh, Michael, do, do you still believe the Fed will actually uh, cut rates? Like, despite what Powell has been saying, like just just looking at the numbers we're getting and the U.S. economy being extremely strong, uh, even the market doesn't really believe in rate hikes anymore. Uh, or sorry, rate cuts anymore. Um, they come down from like seven to eight expected rate cuts for this year, down to two, two and a half at best, and two and a half. I mean, fifty percent of a third one. So, do you believe in rate cuts at all? Like, why would they? Well, I think the answer is what to answer the question, why would they? I think the, the answer would be very clearly it's a political decision. Uh, Jay Powell has already hinted pretty clearly that he wants to cut rates. That's even in the face of stubborn inflationary pressures. So I think one has to uh, you know, give some, some uh, credibility to uh, the Federal Reserve chairman. If he said rates are coming down, then I think we will believe him. I think the fact is the rates are not coming down anything like the market once said. Or once once thought, uh, even back in January of this year, there was a lot of expectation about falling rates in the US. But that, after all, is on the back of uh, recession fears, which have clearly uh, proved wrong. Um, but our point is, do interest rates really matter? What really matters is the flow of liquidity into markets. Uh, that's what's driving everything. It's not about rates. I mean, if you look back over the last 18 months, uh, liquidity has been rising. Uh, asset prices have been rising and interest rate expectations have blown both ways. Uh, sometimes people think the Fed is putting rates up, sometimes people have thought Fed is cutting rates, but throughout that period, uh, the markets basically uh, rallied pretty strongly, and it's all about liquidity. Why is liquidity so important? It comes back to this huge debt burden that the world economy faces. We've got $350 trillion of debt uh, out there to both service and refinance. And the fact is, unlike an equity, a debt has to be repaid or at least, uh, let's say, refinanced. And if you've got $350 trillion of debt with an average maturity of five years, simple math says that you've got to roll over or refinance $70 trillion every year. That is an eye-watering amount of money. And world capital markets have basically switched from being new financing vehicles for capital investment in the real economy to, if you like, debt refinancing mechanisms uh, to roll over this huge burden of, uh, of indebtedness. And to do that, you need liquidity. And that's what the liquidity story is all about. If you don't get that liquidity, you get debt refinancing problems and financial crises. Every financial crisis you care to think of in the last 20 years has been a debt refinancing crisis. And that's what central banks are in the game to try and stop. And what we're seeing now I would argue is the reason that liquidity is going up is very simply that the financial system in the West is in a more fragile situation than many people are attesting to, and therefore it needs liquidity, and the central banks are providing liquidity. The fact is from our, from our, from us as, an inve us as investors is that that liquidity spills over into asset classes. It pushes up technology shares, it pushes up equities in general, it starts to move commodity markets, and ultimately it spills out into the real economy. And these are exactly uh, the effects that we're seeing. It's the sequence and the timeline is being fulfilled. This is a very, very normal investment cycle, despite what the economists claim. No, absolutely. I fully agree there. And uh, the question is, though, where, where is that liquidity coming from right now? You, you mentioned central banks. But is it really the central banks in the West that is supplying that liquidity, maybe through the back door? But uh, or is it coming out of the East? And I'm thinking about maybe Japan, uh, China apparently is flooding the market with money. So I'm curious what your thoughts are. Where do you see that liquidity being created that's flowing into the US, for example? Well, we've got a heat map that you can show, which basically shows the intensity of central bank activity. And what that heat map uh, illustrates, <laughs> the red areas are where central banks are tightening. Um, the timeline runs from east to west, or from west to east, I should say, uh, on, the, on the diagram. And then as we go from north to south, you see a listing of countries. So there's something like in that list, uh, probably about 70 or 80 countries, um, the bulk of the ones we cover. The mosaic, or what, he, what you can see there, the heat map, is basically illustrating uh, the pattern of central bank tightening. The bulk of tightening occurred around about the middle of 2022, you can see that sort of broad red smudge in the middle of the chart. And as we move towards the right hand side of the chart, in other words, moving to date, what we can see is the color, uh, the hues of the chart are changing more and more towards the green end of the spectrum, which is indicating that central banks are easing. 
Now, there's an awful lot of central banks in there that are changing color. In other words, they're moving. Uh, it's fair to say that some of the big Western central banks like the ECB and the Federal Reserve have been slower this cycle to ease, but they are easing in terms of uh, adding liquidity to markets. And one of the points that we've been making uh, pretty consistently over the last 18 months is despite the rhetoric that comes out of the Federal Reserve about them engaging QT, quantitative tightening policies, and shrinking their balance sheet, their liquidity injections into markets, which is a different number, has actually been rising. Uh, and you can see that very visibly by looking at what's happened to U.S. bank reserves over the period, where bank reserves have increased from uh, under $3 trillion to now over five, uh, three and a half trillion dollars. So there's been a noticeable increase of 15% in the volume of bank reserves uh, in America. That's a pure liquidity expansion. So generally, we're seeing central banks easing. Your point about uh, central banks in the East or in emerging markets uh, leading the fray, that's definitely correct. No, I appreciate you clarifying that. I love that chart. I think you've you've shown that us uh, to to us before as well. But it's it's ultra important to to visualize and see where that liquidity is coming from. And M Michael, maybe a bit of a naive question that just popped in my head. I'm curious: uh, is it always the central banks that are providing that liquidity? Because uh, I'm thinking of grants, government grants, for example, like uh, the U.S. giving uh, Intel close to $50 billion to build chip plants in the U.S. That's also liquidity, in my opinion, it's being pumped into a market. Um, is it is it always the central banks? I'm just curious, more of an understanding question, because the money has to come from somewhere. Well, I mean, the, the, the you, you raise a very important point. I mean, the, the question is that that money comes from governments, but governments can't create the money. It has to be somehow funded. So it's either funded through bond issuance, through tax increases, or through the central banks providing it themselves. So it really comes through one of those three channels. Now, um, in terms of who is creating liquidity in the world economy, uh, basically, you've got two, uh, two mechanisms. One is the central banks themselves. They can create liquidity. Or you can also get liquidity from the private sector. And the private sector, through bank lending or shadow bank lending, that is also a source of increased liquidity. Now, it's fair to say that in the last 10 to 15 years, since the global financial crisis, in 2008-9, um, central banks have been the main driver of liquidity in markets. That is unquestionable. They have been leading uh, the cycle. Uh, that is not always the case. Uh, if you go back to the uh, pre, immediately pre-global financial crisis period, it was the private sector through shadow banks. If one runs back into the 1990s, if you recall, you know what was fuming the Asian bubble was really cross-border flows of money. It wasn't the central banks, it wasn't shadow banks or banks, it was basically cross-border investors, and that money was being monetized. So I think it really depends on the period, but you've really got three, uh, you know, generally three sources, cross-border, uh, domestic private sector, and uh, central banks. At the moment, it's central banks, but uh, you know, we've got to expect private sector lending to pick up too. That's likely to be a future source of liquidity. I brought up Japan earlier, Michael, and uh, really curious what your thoughts are on, on liquidity coming out of Japan, the, uh, the yen carry trade here, the buzzword, because uh, Japan raised rates for the first time in 17 years, meaning they're at 0% now, so nothing nothing crazy, but uh, it could be an important signal. I'm curious how you sort of rate that, uh, that the central bank move there in Japan. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in truth, I don't think it's a particularly important signal because I didn't think that it's signaling a tightening by the Bank of Japan. Uh, I think that what uh, what the Japanese are basically trying to do uh, is they are the classic case of operating a policy of financial repression. Uh, in other words, what they're trying to do is to get inflation rates above interest rates, and they want that to run on for uh, some uh, some several years because that will ultimately devalue their big debt pile. I think the other thing that's operating in Japan is the intention to run a loose monetary policy to maintain a weak yen. Now, the consensus trade this year, uh, probably until recently, because so many people have been burned by it, uh, has been that the yen would be a strong currency. That clearly has not uh, transpired. The yen has been a fundamentally weak currency. We've been on the weak side. We've been arguing that the yen would never be strong. And I think the reason for that is an attempt to try and ensure that the Chinese economy is destabilized through uh, an unstable uh, yuan exchange rate. One of the easiest ways to do that is to basically manipulate the yen. Now, mine it may be a maverick view, but it's certainly playing out. And I think the one thing that America cannot afford to do is to allow the yuan to be a recognized currency worldwide for others to save it. 
The dollar has to be paramount. The dollar's position has to be maintained and preserved. And one of the easiest ways to do that, I would argue, is to maintain a weak yen because you're effectively putting pressure on a major economic competitor next door, uh, in other words, China. Uh, and as a result of yen weakness, the Chinese yuan itself has weakened over the past 12 months. So I think that uh, you know what, what you see here is what you get. So I think that Japan is running a loose policy. I think we'll continue to run a loose policy. I think that uh, raising rates to uh, going from negative to uh, zero rates at the short end is purely cosmetic for the simple reason that the market already had got there anyway. So if you looked at one year interest rates in Japan, they were already, they were already significantly above zero. So the market has already discounted this. It's not a tightening by any means. So you don't see a risk of liquidity flowing from the West back to the East, meaning East Japan there, like uh, some analysts predicted that, uh, you know, reshoring some of the financial assets that are parked in the US. Well, I think that, you... I, yeah, I, look, I think I think to answer that, that's a slightly different question. I think the question is, it, has Japan got a funding problem? Uh, has America got a funding problem? Has Europe got a funding problem? Answer to all three, yes, 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 uh, they have. And if in a world where savings or liquidity is scarce, Uh, particularly for government debt markets, then uh, there may well be repatriation of Japanese money uh, back to Japan. That was just, you know, if you like, making a bigger hole for the Americans to fill in terms of who buys their debt. But what it's pushing back to more and more and more is that those gaps in government funding have to be met uh, by some form of monetization. Now, whether that is direct monetization by the central bank is a moot point, Or do they change the rules and they force or encourage banks to buy more treasury debt? And the point that we've we've been making consistently for the last few years is that basically the world is in a war or pre-war situation. Now, whether that is a renewed Cold War against China or whether it's a war against domestic demographics, it doesn't matter. If war economies need to be financed, war economies or war finance is inflationary. And what it requires is more monetization and the banks holding more and more government debt. And what you can see going on now is very subtle attempts to encourage or allow the banks to hold more government debt, whether that is changing the supplemental liquidity ratio rules, whether it's reinventing uh, a, a Basel IV to say uh, the banks can own more treasury debt, uh, whatever. There is going to be some attempt to get the banks to, uh, to increase their exposure to the debt markets. Uh, and that is something I think we can all look forward to. That is pure monetization. And monetization means only one thing, and that is that monetary hedges, the value of monetary hedges, like gold, uh, like Bitcoin or uh, other cryptocurrencies, tends to go tend to go up in value. And that is the reality. We'll talk about the commodities in a second, especially the precious metals, and we, we can throw in Bitcoin as well, although that's not a focus of ours here on the channel, but uh, I think it goes hand in hand. Um, you, you brought in geopolitics, and I think that's an interesting topic to explore um, within that liquidity spectrum and space as well. Um, you brought in China and keeping China and the UN uh, sort of weakened. I think it was us that would like. I think it was you I've, I've had that discussion with. You said uh, China doesn't have the banking infrastructure to sort of handle the liquidity that the U.S. can, that New York can. Do you, do you see that changing? Because that would be the one of the very few reasons that China might actually become uh, a main player in the financial markets, um, you know, outside of New York. Yes, I think the I think the issue is that you know what China has uh, basically a, a, a very straightforward financial system. Um, unfortunately, China's financial system is too hooked on the dollar, and they need to get off the dollar hook. And that is easier said than done. So one of the things the Chinese would like to do in the medium term is to make the yuan currency uh, much more of an international standard of value if they could. So in other words, they like commodities priced in yuan, they'd like, uh, they'd like uh, other governments to hold or other investors to hold yuan currency. Uh, I wish them good luck with that, because I think that's quite a hard ask at the moment, particularly in a world of geopolitical tensions. What you're seeing, for example, right now, the Saudis uh, uh, are arguably, or let's say parts of the Middle East, it's not just the Saudis, are accepting yuan payments for oil. Okay, But the important thing is, as far as one can tell, they are not holding balances in yuan. So they may be transacting in yuan, but they're not saving in yuan. And that's a very important distinction. Because if they started to save in yuan, there may be a much, much bigger problem for the US dollar. But that is not happening yet. And that is probably a big, big step for many of these Middle Eastern governments to make. Uh, but that's what it would entail. 
uh, for the Chinese yuan to become more of a recognized currency. I think we're a long, long way away from that. Uh, I think the dollar is still paramount. And my view, which you probably heard me argue before, is that I still believe we're in a Bre Bretton Woods one regime. Uh, and Bretton Woods one, my reading of that is the dollar is the paramount currency worldwide. And I think that will continue. America is clearly intending to preserve that uh, uh, that dominance. And that's why I think that uh, the yuan uh, is being targeted right now. No, fantastic. It makes it makes a lot of sense. But the question is, like, what could destabilize the dollar right now? It, it seems to be extremely strong, despite the massive deficits. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office has put out, uh, you know, forecasts. I think it was till 2030, uh, 40, 40 trillion dollars in debt and, and rising constantly. I think it was the annual co the compound annual growth rate was eight percent, nine percent, which is staggering because we're already at two and a half trillion dollars deficit. And that rising by eight percent, like what could topple the U.S. dollar in that regard? Is there something that you see that that could bring it down right now? Like, yeah, unless, uh, the, besides, uh, so, sorry, it's like uh, so, so one of my commentators mentioned, I shouldn't put answers in your mouth, but uh, a BRICS gold back currency. Well, I don't, I don't think a BRICS gold back currency necessarily would be the thing. I think the dollar would be the source of its own demise. And uh, you answer the question by saying, look at the debt burden that America is taking on. That has to be financed. And uh, the, at the end of the day, what, what, what we're looking at is a long-term monetary inflation. Um, the Congressional Budget Office, as you rightly say, is extrapolating or projecting a doubling of the U.S. debt-to-GDP ratio uh, over the next 25 years. I mean, that is an eye-wateringly uh, big jump. And it's coming because you've got uh, not only increased defense spending outlays, you've also got mandatory spending, which is being required because the, the world, or particularly, uh, let's say, the, the West, and the US are aging. Uh, and these are these are commitments that governments have made, whether it's Medicare or whether it's Social Security or whatever, those payments have to be made good uh, unless they're unless they're renegated upon. But uh, that uh, that debate clearly isn't one which is live in the current presidential debates. Um, if you look at this monetary inflation angle, what we are saying is that the only way that governments can afford their current commitments is to monetize debt. Now, what that means is either the, they're getting their central banks to own the debt or getting the banking systems themselves to own the debt, but it's monetization. It is, we know that monetization ultimately is inflationary, and we know what's more, that it pushes up the price of gold and other monetary hedges. Now, if you look at the chart that I've also displayed, which is looking at the gold price, I think you can see there that there is something very, very important going on. And what that chart illustrates is the price of gold bullion. It may be even, maybe it's now you know, a couple of weeks out of date, so we're racing higher all the time. But alongside that, what we put on that chart is U.S. real interest rates. Now, normally, there is a very strong correlation between real interest rates and the gold price. And as we know, if real interest rates go up, the gold price normally goes down. And if real interest rates fall, the gold price goes up. So what we've got now is relatively high real interest rates in America. But look, when, lo and behold, the gold price is rising. Uh, this is a very, very unusual development. I can't stress that more. And what it's telling us, there is another dynamic at work out there. And that other dynamic is basically the trend that is driving gold and other precious metals and monetary inflation from hedges like cryptocurrencies higher, which is monetary inflation. And, you know, I can move on to another chart, which is showing this one, which is looking at the, and this is, let me just stress uh, right out front here. This is looking at weekly data. So it's a very short term view. And it basically goes back uh, uh, to, I think on that chart, we're looking at data, which goes back to 2017. So it's a short term window. But what it's telling us is that gold and global liquidity move together. In other words, if you get an expansion in global liquidity, and that is what I'm talking about, my monetary inflation, you are going to get a higher gold price. And what this says, if you look at the, if those are those people that are watching that are mathematically inclined, the little equation you can see there, which has uh, the, below the scatter diagram, which says 1.49, is saying effectively that for every 100% uh, increase in global liquidity, you've got a, basically 149 say 150% increase in the value of gold. So gold is a very, very important monetary inflation hedge, which you can see in detail on this chart, which goes back much, much further, all the way back to 1975. And what it's showing is the path of global liquidity, which is the black line. The orange line is a hybrid, which looks at 
the value of gold and including more recently since 2015, the value of cryptocurrencies. Uh, but as I say, the bulk of that history is gold. And you can see that gold is moving, or let's say those gold plus crypto are moving directly with global liquidity. That is monetary inflation. The dotted line at the bottom is high street inflation. That is what's happening to US CPI. So gold is not a high street inflation hedge. It is a monetary inflation hedge. And that's a much more important statement because we're going to get lots of monetary inflation. Will we get high street inflation? I don't know. I suspect we will. But that's a very, very different uh, question. We'll be we, too bad we're doing this on Tuesday. Like tomorrow, we're getting a new US CPI print as well, which is expected to be yet again a little higher, 3.4% as forecast by Reuters. W what is driving that, uh, my Michael, as well? Like you, you mentioned commodities and the oil price has been rallying in, re in recent weeks. Uh, is, is that what's behind that? And like how, how sticky is that um, in, in that context? Well, I think that inflation probably is sticky. I think that it's. Um, you know, I think on, on most measures, um, you know, if you look at a personal inflation rate and you can ask anybody anecdotally, I think the rate of inflation certainly feels to me a lot more than the uh, whatever it may be, 3% that is being quoted in the official numbers. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, if you just take their metrics, I think what we're going to be seeing in the next uh, 12, 18 months is a higher level of inflation than we've been used to. I'm not talking here of 10 or 15 percent rates. What I'm suggesting is that the level of inflation is probably going to run on at about one, maybe one percent, two percent above what we've been used to in the last decade. So we're looking at probably sustained rates of inflation of four to five percent per annum. Um, but, you know, against interest rates of uh, what may be four to four, four to five percent is telling you that you've got. Uh, negative real interest rates, which is what probably what governments want, because it's very slowly eroding um, the value of debt. Now, in this environment where you've got negative real interest rates and stubborn inflation, you've got seriously to think uh, as, as investors, where do you hold your wealth? You don't want to hold it in government bonds because government bonds are going to lose value. OK, uh, that's the history of, of inflationary periods and monetary inflation periods. Uh, the governments will force banks and they'll try and force pension funds and insurance companies as much as they can, anyone under their control to own their bonds because they have to. But if you don't have to own government bonds, I certainly wouldn't. I'd be putting money into areas that traditionally hedge. That could be equities. Uh, it's very likely to be gold, precious metals, cryptocurrencies as well. It may be residential real estate, particularly if you're buying in prime areas. Uh, that could work as well. But these are the traditional monetary inflation hedges that everyone's got to start thinking about seriously. The world has changed. I can't keep emphasizing that enough because of the rapid and significant deterioration of fiscal finances, particularly in the wake of the COVID crisis. Uh, the COVID crisis was the first emergency where policymakers did not raise taxes. They printed money. But this is you know, a wake up call to everybody because this is what's going to happen in the future. If there's another pandemic or if there's more spending to be made, uh, believe me, governments are not going to raise taxes. You don't hear any of that on the hustings uh, in the U.S. presidential elections, do you now? Um, that's just simply going to happen. Nobody, nobody in the West, I think, would argue for higher taxes. If they did, it's political suicide. Who would do it? But what we're looking at now is an investment cycle uh, on top of a rising trend that looks extremely normal. And the chart that I put up will probably, if you like, crystallize that, which basically says this is the asset allocation that you should be looking at in terms of how the cycle evolves. Now, we split the investment cycle into four areas, rebound, calm, speculation, and turbulence, depending on where in the cycle you are. So rebound is coming from the bottom of the cycle, the trough to the mid-cycle. Calm is from the mid-cycle to the peak, etc. Now, in terms of where we are right now, for 18 months, we've been in rebound. And if you look at the traffic lights on, uh, on the diagram, on the left, it's assets. Or on the right, it's industry groups within the stock market. This is historic analysis of what should perform strongly. Okay, And all I would say is if you look at those charts, tell me honestly if we're in a rebound or not, because everything that's in the rebound has been performing uh, on both sides of that diagram. In other words, you would expect equities to be a strong performer, credits to be a strong performer, 
commodities not to be, bond duration not to be. You'd expect uh, cyclical equities on the right to be good performers, technology stocks, financials to be mixed, energy to be underweight, and defensives to be to underperform. As we move to calm, look how that changes. Equities are still good. Credits start to falter. But what comes through? Commodities. OK, so the rising commodities we should have been expecting will be had. But I mean, investors should be expecting. And that's what we argue we're getting now. You still don't want bond duration. And if you look at the right, you're starting to see outperformance coming from big financials like JP Morgan and energy stocks, which are breaking out now. So, you know, what you see is what you get, but it looks a very, very normal cycle. And as the next chart says, this is a chart which illustrates our own analysis of the world business cycle and shipping. Now, this is not proprietary data. It's data we've just gathered uh, from the public domain. It's basically analyzing port activity at major ports worldwide, which is shown on that uh, orange line. That's picked up dramatically in the last few months, largely because of Asia Pacific trade. Uh, we accept or we acknowledge there may be some bias in that data because of the closure of Suez or whatever it may be. But I would suspect that there is still an underlying truth in that recovery. And if you look at the black line, that is the latest world business cycle uh, as of the, uh, the uh, end of March, which is basically showing um, a rebound coming through uh, in terms of uh, how the world economy or business confidence worldwide is responding. Look at the US ISM, it's definitely picking up. Um, you know, lots of evidence here that we're seeing a business cycle turn. The group that brings out the business cycle analysis as well, I forgot the name, I was trying to look it up real quick. Um, but there, there's a group that publishes sort of uh, cycle analysis as well. Um, they're saying we, we're not going to see a recession, like the recession fears are done with. It might be a very soft landing at best. Where, where do you come in then? It's like, are we getting away with one here? I've asked that other guests on the show as well. Like, is the U.S. even getting away with one? Um, like, it sounds very, uh, like, what do you call it? It's like laps, like very, trying to be very, like, jovial maybe here. But uh, it, are, are they lucky? It's like by printing money, by throwing money at the problem, are they getting away with uh, not having a recession, Michael? Yes. In short, they are. <laughs> I mean, we, we've not been in the in the recession camp at all. Um, the reason basically is because what you've seen uh, generally over the course of the last 18 months has been a very, very loose U.S. fiscal policy. The U.S. Uh, federal deficit is running at about 8% of GDP. With that level of stimulus, how can the economy be soft? Uh, that's reality. The Federal Reserve has eased money into the economy uh, despite what they've said that they're tightening, look at other indicators like the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. Certainly tells you that, uh, or even just look at markets. It certainly tells you that there's not a shortage of liquidity around. So I think all those factors are telling us that there's stimulus uh, going on, and that is clearly coming through to the to the real economies. Business confidence is beginning to pick up. Uh, you know, even if you look at the ISM, that's clear. But just look around the world; it's certainly uh, you're getting traction in many, many economies, uh, you know, even in China. The Chinese uh, People's Bank uh, began to ease policy aggressively from about the middle of last year, uh, and that is helping to spur the Chinese economy forward. And I would suspect there's a lot more stimulus coming. So in my view, the world economy is beginning to accelerate, and that's why I'm skeptical about whether, let me say, whether we should have interest rate cuts in the US. Um, I think that what from what Jay Powell has said, we probably will, but I think he's going to disappoint the uh, the earlier expectations of uh, of the markets in terms of uh, you know maybe only one or two cuts rather than the six they have once factored in. But I don't think that matters uh, anyway because it's about liquidity, not about rates. I, I saw an article this morning where it says the U.S. small business sentiment slides to lowest level in more than eleven years. How important is that? Like, it would, uh, how do I rank and how do I rate that uh, that headline, Michael? Well, I think it's important. I am not. I'm not dismiss it. I'm not going to dismiss that. But I think that is one of the one of the consequences of having uh, interest rates high for a long period of time, because it's those type of companies that are actually being affected adversely by high interest rates. So, if there was one area of the economy that you would suspect would, uh, you know, feel the squeeze, it would be the small business sector. But that's purely because rates are high. I think that's putting pressure on J Pound to actually cut rates. I think the uh, uh, the disturbing situation, a number of U.S. regional banks is also urging 
the Federal Reserve to go easy on terms of tightening and to add liquidity. So in my view, that these factors are, if you like, overpowering, overpowering um, the policy of trying to get inflation back down to 2%. Um, you know, I think that uh, clearly I'm not suggesting the Fed is deliberately trying to create inflation, but I think that, um, you know, the idea of, uh, of getting below 2% is probably, uh, you know, a bit of a pipe dream here. I don't think they're going to get anywhere near that. Uh, but you know, maybe three percent, maybe an underlying level of four percent inflation in the in the U.S. economy is acceptable going forward. I would imagine, with the amount of debt that the U.S. has taken on, uh, that's probably a, a, the sort of level they should be aiming at. To be truthful, yeah. Look, looking at the deficit spending and in, in general, like you, you have to have inflation and and two percent, three percent. I'm not the expert on that. If we're ever going to get back to two percent, but it doesn't sound likely. And uh, that's for the experts to discuss, Michael. That's for that's for yeah. you to figure out. I'll leave that up to you. Um, but I want to come back to commodities, and uh, we we've seen the moves, or commodities and maybe cryptos as as well. I think we can lump them together here. But the moves we've seen the last few weeks have been extremely violent to the upside. Like I thought it was powerful moves here in gold. We're rallying every day uh, as we ever speak as we're speaking. We're at twenty three fifty for gold per ounce. Why why now? Uh, maybe is the question, and what what is driving that violent move? Why is it not more gradual? Why is that move so violent, Michael? I think it's a very interesting point. I, I, I think that um, what I would say, Kai, is that uh, the thing that seemed to get the gold market moving was the statement from Governor Waller of the Federal Reserve, which indicated that the Federal Reserve was going to uh, start funding more at the short end. Uh, in other words, they were going to shift the balance of their portfolio away from longer dated coupons towards shorter, shorter dated coupons. Now, perhaps the market extrapolated a lot or projected a lot in those statements. Uh, maybe they weren't justified, but I think as regards to the trigger, that may have been a trigger. And perhaps what the market was saying is that there's no smoke without fire here. If the Federal Reserve is suggesting that they're going to start funding uh, at the shorter end or holding, uh, holding debt, uh, treasury debt at the shorter end, in other words, one year, two year or whatever, um, then does that tell us anything about what the Treasury itself is going to start issuing? Is the Treasury going to stop issuing longer dated coupons and start going shorter term? Uh, those shorter term bonds tend to be uh, targeted most on credit providers like banks. And if the banks start to buy those, uh, those shorter dated bonds, that is pure monetization. And pure monetization means gold goes up. So there is a logic in the gold markets rally. Um, that would be the only way I could make sense of it. But in any case, the fact is that the underlying trends in monetary inflation would anyway justify uh, a, a higher and a rising gold market over the medium term. My, my colleagues, like, I, I just uh, found that the World Gold Council put up the report for March uh, for the ETF flows in particular, which I'm really keen on. Uh, and I look at as coincidence that it came out today. Um, but gold ETFs, global gold ETFs, lost again $823 million in March. So there's outflows happening. Uh, inflows in the US, $360 million. Uh, inflows in, in Asia, $217 million. But Europe, massive outflows of $1.4 billion. All right. So my question is, and I wrote that down earlier, who, who is actively hedging right now? Because who, who is buying the gold, essentially, is the question, Michael. Well, I mean, the, the, the fact is that, uh, that somebody must be buying it because the price is going up. But I think that what you're seeing is that central banks we know over the medium term, particularly uh, non-Western central banks, have been accumulating a large amount of gold. Uh, and that would, you know, clearly with these geopolitical tensions, that would make sense. But I think what you're starting to see is a lot more hedging activity going on, whether it be hedge funds or whoever, private investors buying gold, I don't know. But the reality is that the gold market is breaking higher. It deserves to break higher. And what you want in this environment is you want monetary inflation hedges. Now, we did some statistical analysis uh, a few months ago, which was looking at the relative performance of uh, cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin, uh, against monetary inflation and gold against monetary inflation. And what you find, in fact, interestingly enough, in the data, and I don't know quite why it works that way, but this is what the data shows, is that uh, it takes something like three to six months after a monetary surge for the gold market to really to get uh, traction, to start moving higher. Uh, it takes something like four to six weeks for cryptocurrencies to move on that. 
uh, same basis. So both asset classes are very sensitive to liquidity. In actual fact, uh, you know, we've described cryptocurrencies as exponential gold because their sensitivity is, is a factor greater than gold bullion itself. But nonetheless, both are good in uh, monetary inflation hedges. The fact is, though, that cryptocurrencies moves, move faster and they move first compared with gold. The gold is, if you like, a more stable long-term asset. It's got a much, much uh, stronger long-term record uh, or historical record. We can be more confident that it's a monetary inflation hedge and uh, gold deserves to move up in line with what these other assets are doing. Fantastic. Michael, f phenomenal analysis. Like one, one last question though. And uh, how, how much longer is that sustainable? Let the current move in goal. Like I, I'm, I'm not asking for a price target. It's more of a time frame. Like you, I think you mentioned 18 months earlier um, until we reach at least the peak of that current liquidity cycle. Is that correct? Uh, so I'm curious if that's correlating also maybe with a peak in the gold price at that point uh, or in the cryptos. Well, I think it's, you know, I think you've got a, and when, when you're looking at investments, I think you've got to look at both the trend and you've got to look at the, at the cycle. And I think that, you know, in terms of, of my vision of what's going on right now, I would say there are three time windows. There's a very short term, uh, you know, in the next month to six weeks, why I would suspect that the U.S. tax paying season is going to take a lot of liquidity out of U.S. financial markets and may cause uh, an air pocket, a temporary air pocket. Uh, and that could be an opportunity for investors uh, if they want to buy risk assets to move back into markets if there's any near-term drop. But discounting that and looking forward to the medium term, let's put that out to the end of 2025. We have a cyclical upturn in liquidity, we believe, that will last until that point. In other words, late 2025. Then you may get uh, a liquidity downswing. That liquidity downswing may be because uh, inflation worries cause central banks to tighten a bit more. It may be because the world real economy is accelerating so fast that it's sucking liquidity out of financial markets. But effectively, what you've got is a headwind for financial assets uh, around that time or sometime in late 2025 in our current estimation. In the long term, so let's go three, five, ten years forward, what you've got is the prospect of considerable monetary inflation for the simple reason that the fiscal arithmetic simply does not add up. And if you, you know, if you doubt me, take a look <laughs> at the Congressional Budget Office uh, in the U.S. It's completely transparent. Their estimates are put on uh, on the internet. You can read their reports, and what they're showing is a radical deterioration in U.S. finances. Now, I'm not hitting on the U.S. here because the U.S. is the cleanest shirt in the laundry. All the other governments worldwide in the West have a much more parlous situation when it comes to fiscal finances. Uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, welfare system is nothing like as generous as Europe's, and the demographic situation in, in uh, the U.S. is nothing like as bad as Europe. Europe has a really serious problem at how they afford these things. What's more, by all accounts, they've got an even bigger defense bill to start funding uh, if the US starts to pull back with uh, with NATO support. So, you know, Europe have got a big problem. Uh, America has a problem, but that problem is actually very transparent. But in the long term, monetary inflation is going up, either directly through central banks funding governments or indirectly by getting banks to do the, uh, do the legwork for them. Uh, and that's what we're concerned about. That is monetary inflation. That means gold goes up, and that means you want a monetary inflation hedge in a portfolio. Phenomenal. Michael, that, that was uh, a great note to end on and uh, a great closing closing remarks there, Michael. That worked out really well. Couldn't have ended the conversation any better. Um, last question, where can we find more of your work, Michael? You can uh, you can look at our sub stack, which is called Capital Wars. Um, that is uh, that is a, a commentary for uh, you know high net worth um, resale investors. We have a professional service, which is for institutional investors, which you can find on crossbordercapital.com. Um, and we provide data analysis, narrative, whatever people want, all about global liquidity and its impact. And then we do occasional tweets on Twitter or X, uh, where the handle is at crossbordercap. So that's the three main sources of information. Phenomenal. Michael, I tremendously enjoyed this conversation. Truly appreciate your time. Hope to do this again very soon. Maybe we'll see each other in Frankfurt again uh, uh, at, the, at the end of the year. Would love to have you again uh, at our conference and uh, we'll, we'll chat before then, definitely. So um, 
everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. This is truly a Sunday episode of Soar Financially. It's really worth listening to it on a weekend. Take your time. I hope you enjoyed your coffee while listening to it. Thanks so much for tuning in. We tremendously appreciate every single subscriber. If you're not a subscriber, kindly hit that subscribe button. It helps us bring guests like Michael onto the channel and it helps our reach. It helps educate because our goal is to educate investors. Like what is happening on the macro level so you can make decision on a micro scale. Of course, we've talked a lot about gold. That's where we come from. Uh, that's that's our background, uh, the mining space, of course. So we're trying to put everything a bit, a bit into perspective uh, with that angle in, in mind. If you like the conversation, leave a like, leave a comment. We're always looking for for constructive criticism. And uh, are we asking the right questions? What questions would you ask? Put that down below. It helps us. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more and uh, enjoy your weekend. Michael, that was probably one of the best episodes I've recorded this year.